I'm Selena Wing in San Francisco, and for Emily Chang, this is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up in the next hour, Jeff Bezos stands up for press freedom. The Amazon founder and Washington Post owner says leaders should welcome robust criticism. Plus, California Governor Jerry Brown continues his pushback on the Trump administration's environmental rollback plans. We'll hear from him at the Global Climate Action Summit. And another Chinese tech company listed in New York. We'll hear why video news aggregator app Chito Tiao chose the United States. But first, our top story, the world's richest man is standing up for press freedoms and criticizing President Trump at the same time. Speaking at the Economic Club of Washington on Bloomberg TV's David Rubenstein show, Amazon CEO Jeff Bezos, who also owns The Washington Post, said the president should welcome media criticism. Take a listen. I will say this. Um, it is a mistake for any elected official, in my opinion, I don't think this is a very uh, out there opinion, to attack media and journalists. Um, I believe that it is an essential component of our democracy. There has never been, I was gonna say never been an elected official who liked their headlines. I think there's probably a no, no public figure who has ever liked their headlines. It's okay, it's part of the process. You know, it's, it's, um, if you're the president of the United States or a governor of a state or whatever, you, you don't take that job thinking you're not going to get scrutinized. You're going to get scrutinized, and it's, it's, it's healthy. And um, somebody very, uh, you know, what, 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 um, what the president should say is, this is right, this is good, I'm glad I'm being scrutinized, and that would be so secure and confident. But it's really dangerous to demonize the media. It's dangerous to call the media lowlifes. It's dangerous to say that they're the enemy of the people. We live in a society where it's not just the laws of the land that protect us. We do have freedom of press. It's in the Constitution. We, but, we, but, we, but it's also the social norms that protect us. Those, it, we, we, it works because we believe those words on that piece of paper. And every time you attack that, you're eroding it a little bit around the edges. Now look, I don't want to be dramatic here. We are so robust in this country, the media is going to be fine. We're going to push through this. And, and by the way, Marty Baron would tell you, this is a super important point. He will always say, he meet, when he meets with the newsroom, I've heard him say it many times, I say it myself when I meet with journalists at the Washington Post. We, he, Marty says, we are, the, the administration may be at war with us. We are not at war with the administration. Just do the work. Just do the work. That's Marty's friend. And, um, so you have, uh, I, I didn't mention the president, but you mentioned the president. So since you mentioned the president, have you met the president? He, did, he was a lawyer, wasn't he? Right. So you've met the president uh, on a couple occasions and yeah. you talked to him very much. Does he call you in for lunch or dinner? Not that much? Well, I'll keep my conversations with the president um, to myself. Uh, uh, but yes, I've had a couple of okay. conversations with him. And this doesn't make you think you want the job yourself, though, right? It's not a job you would ever aspire to. Are you asking me if I would run for president? Yes. I'll be your VP. <laughs> you run. <laughs> you run. Bezos made those comments on Thursday, which is the same day he tweeted that he pledged $2 billion towards preschool education for low-income families and for funding homeless shelter. Now let's go to D.C. where Bloomberg Spencer Soper, who covers Amazon, and Naomi Nix, who covers corporate influence, who are both standing by. Spencer, this seems pretty significant. I mean, you have Bezos essentially calling out Trump, who's been a very vocal critic of Amazon, and Bezos, meantime, owns the Washington Post. What do you make of this whole situation? Well, Bezos was in D.C. It's the hometown of the Washington Post. Um, he, he's got to back up his journalists and his papers, so he did that. He didn't really address um, the criticism of Amazon growing too big and powerful, other than to say that he didn't see it as a, as a significant threat, that no matter what new, new regulations are imposed, you know, customers are always going to want low prices, fast delivery, and, and vast selection. So um, it, there, there has been this uh, 
funny relationship between Bezos and Trump. The pattern seems to be that Trump attacks Amazon when he feels attacked by the Washington Post. And so what we saw here was that Bezos feels an obligation to defend his journalists at the Washington Post, but he doesn't really feel a need to engage on the bigger picture of, of what, uh, what government can do to Amazon. Right, Naomi, this comes at a time when he's facing growing political backlash from the left and the right. I want to take a quick listen at what he said about this uh, during his talk there. It's really important that, um, that um, politicians and others uh, not, they need to understand the value that big companies bring and, and not demonize or vilify business in general or especially, not business, well, they shouldn't vilify big companies and they shouldn't vilify business in general for sure. Naomi, you have Trump criticizing Amazon on one hand, Bernie Sanders on the other. I mean, how does the scrutiny that Amazon face really different from his other tech giant peers? Well, a lot of the backlash that other tech companies like Facebook, Google, and Twitter um, have uh, faced recently from politicians on both sides of the aisles, you know, questions about whether they're uh, being biased against conservative voices, questions about um, how Russians were able to use social media giants to influence the 26th presidential election. Amazon has managed to avoid. Um, but that doesn't mean that there aren't people in Washington asking questions about whether Amazon is getting a little bit too big. Um, and so it's not that the, there's not danger for Amazon and Jeff Bezos in Washington, but a lot of the brunt of the public uh, criticism that tech companies have faced and have gotten a lot of media attention um, have been focused elsewhere in the industry. Right, and Spencer, at that event, Bezos also sketched out his philo philanthropic visions, and up until now, he's been pretty invisible when it comes to that. So why did he choose now to outline his broad ambitions here? Well, he's in his 50s. He's the world's wealthiest man, and you can only be the world's wealthiest man for so long, you know, without being a big donor to some causes, without being called a hoarder. So it's his time, you know, he's, uh, if you look at the traje trajectory of, of Bill Gates, you know, there's a time where he's very focused on growing Microsoft and then later he became more philanthropic. And so now this is Bezos' time to become more, more philanthropic. And remember a year ago, he tweeted out kind of a crowdsourcing um, plea, help me give this wealth away. Uh, and they received 47,000 some odd responses. Last night he said that homelessness and education were two things that um, emerged as things that are very important to people. And he's also uh, feels that uh, early intervention and child education, getting a kid on, on a good path to education early is the best step rather than trying to intervene later and get them caught up. Uh, and then with, with homelessness, uh, it just looks like they're going to try to support existing shelters that are, are making a difference, that have a track record of success and throw more resources out them so that they can you know, get a multiplier on, on, on the programs that they're, that they're having that are working. His pledge to help homeless families, though, Spencer, comes at a weird time. It comes just months after he helped overturn a proposed tax in Seattle that would have brought a lot of funding to the homeless situation in Seattle. So why is this happening? Yeah, so a a Amazon fought very aggressively against, against a tax in Seattle that would have generated, I think, about $50 million a year for uh you know, programs for the homeless and to create affordable housing. Amazon fought that. It was a tax on big employers and Amazon would have been the, the primary target of that tax and they didn't like it. What this shows is that Bezos is fine, uh, you know, supporting the homeless as long as it's on his terms and not on, on, on government's terms. He's more comfortable doing it philanthropic, philanthropically than he is uh, just having his wealth taken and the government deciding how it should be spent. And Naomi, we're months ahead of the midterms, and Bezos has made a big political foray with this $10 million donation into the super PAC called the With Honor Fund. What do we know about this super PAC? So this is a PAC that's dedicated to putting more veterans in Congress who are dedicated to working across the aisle um, and to get things done in Washington. So the candidates they support have to take a pledge uh, to not only meet with a member of the uh, opposing party regularly, but also sponsor legislation. And the whole goal is, is really a tall task here in Washington. It's to increase civility and bipartisanship. Um, 
And Spencer, the affordable housing shortage is very acute in places like Seattle and where I am now in San Francisco, where the tech boom has helped fuel these rising costs of housing. Does Bezos' investment in this area even put a dent on the situation? Not really. I mean, and especially with his, with him saying that this money is predominantly going to go to homeless shelters. That's the symptom of the affordable housing crisis, right? That's not the solution. The solution is more affordable housing, not more shelters. And when you speak with experts on homelessness, uh, shelters are actually uh, quite expensive. And it's a, a much more cost effective way to address the affordable housing crisis to create more affordable housing and to intervene before people go homeless. And one example of that is like uh, uh, preventing evictions and that sort of things. Those things that lead to this, you know, catastrophic situation where people don't have a roof over their head. So you can intervene earlier and prevent them from being homeless. That's a more cost effective solution. But Bezos is putting the band aid on the sim symptom with, uh, with homeless shelters. All right, Bloomberg's Naomi Nix and Spencer Soper, thank you both for joining. And you can see more of that interview with Amazon's Jeff Bezos on the David Rubenstein Show, Peer to Peer Conversations. It airs Wednesday at 9 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Pacific. Now, SpaceX has its first passenger for a flight around the moon, but exactly who it'll be remains a mystery. The rocket company says it will reveal the person's identity on Monday. CEO Elon Musk was asked on Twitter whether he was a passenger. His response, a single emoji of the Japanese flag. SpaceX and Richard Branson's Virgin Galactic are among the companies attempting to commercialize space travel. Last year, SpaceX announced it planned to send two unidentified private citizens on around the moon missions in late 2018. Still ahead on Bloomberg Technology, we are back at the Global Climate Action Summit in San Francisco to hear from California Governor Jerry Brown on his push back against the Trump administration's environmental rollback plans. And if you like Bloomberg News, check us out on the radio. You can listen on the Bloomberg app, Bloomberg.com, and in the U.S. on Sirius XM. This is Bloomberg. The state of California has sought to lead on climate change for a generation and continues to push back on the Trump administration's plans to roll back environmental protections. It's also planning to get to 100 percent renewable energy by 2045. And one of the names at the forefront of all this is Governor Jerry Brown. He spoke with Bloomberg's David Weston at the Global Climate Action Summit in San Francisco about how to fight climate change without the help of the White House. We can make a lot of progress, but obviously we need uh, not only the U.S. government at the federal level all in, we need all the countries of the world. But pending that, which we don't have, uh, we have the ability of states, California, New York, uh, Vermont, Washington, uh, Colorado, New Jersey, all these states are, are willing to do their part. We've got to cut uh, carbon emissions. We see the storms uh, off North Carolina. Uh, now, that's the kind of thing that is going to happen more and more often and more and more deadly. So, yes, that, the report that's issued uh, that you re reference, we can do a lot. Uh, we're getting more electric cars. We're getting more renewable energy. We're uh, supporting more installation of uh, uh, batteries uh, for our electric cars and our storage. So lots of things to do. Uh, but ultimately, we need the leaders of every country in the world, Russia, China, U.S., all all in on trying to combat climate change before it gets so deadly that we see mass migrations, tropical diseases, and widespread deaths from uh, suffocating heat. Those are all real. Now, they may be 30 years away, right. but in the lifetime of right. most of your listeners. Right. You, you really need and want the affirmative support of the federal government. Can the federal government actually inhibit the progress you are making? Because as you know, there's a fight right now, particularly between the state of California and the federal government on fuel standards involving automobiles. Uh, does the Calif state of California have the right to proceed if the federal government says it can't? No, we do have the right under a law signed by Richard Nixon when he was president and Ronald Reagan was governor of California. He was my predecessor when I became governor the last time. So look, we got the power. Now, President Trump, under certain procedures, can uh, try to eliminate that and he's doing that and we're fighting him in court and I believe we will be in court longer than he'll be president. So he's not going to take away that power 
and it's crucial that we uh, maintain our effort. And let me tell you why. It's not only about clean, clean air. Uh, it's about not only about efficiency of our cars, but the next 10 years will show the dominance of the electric car. Is that going to be a China hegemony or is America going to be in the game? President Trump, by his actions, is sabotaging the American car industry. And before he gets away with that, we have to wake up the country to say, hey, America has to invest in batteries, invest in hydrogen cars, in electric cars, in charging stations. If we don't do that, we will suffer uh, an onslaught of foreign electric cars that will be coming our way. So uh, right. not only is it bad for right. the environment, it's bad for the economy and bad right. for America's position in the world. Trump must be stopped and must be stopped now. That's what California's commitment is. So, so Governor, you also have another commitment. It, it, it's a pretty aggressive goal. You've signed, as I understand, into, into uh, law a goal of having California as a state be carbon-free by the year 2045. I'm going to put up a couple of charts. You might not be able to see them, but you're familiar with them that show the breakdown in uh, depends on oil for California and it depends on natural gas on nuclear and on renewables and while renewables have been growing some it's a relatively modest portion of the overall energy demands for the state of California and in fact through Bloomberg and NEF which is our special outfit that covers these things uh, you're the second most uh, second largest consumer of oil in the country as a state second only to Texas how is the state of California going to reach these lofty goals they're pretty aggressive uh, three things. We got to have the electric car currently being pushed more by China than the United States. But we are definitely looking for five million electric cars by 2030, maybe more. Can we get there? Only if China, California and other states uh, and the auto industry makes that investment. Number two, we need the batteries, the electric batteries for storage. We need storage to complement intermittent power that comes from wind and solar. And third, we need a regional grid that will allow us to share power at peak times with our uh, other states. And then we need other technologies. We need commitments by builders for their buildings. We need healthier soils. We have to capture carbon uh, in our forests. So yes, it's a very daunting task. But if we don't get there, what you see in North Carolina will be a tea party. The fires have never been worse, and they're going to get five times worse if we don't deal uh, and, and, and reduce our carbon. So it's just an imperative. It's when, when Hitler was uh, moving across Europe, uh, it was not going to be cheap to, to fight him back. Well, fighting back climate change is not cheap either. If we don't do it, we will suffer. And I don't think that's what people want. And everything I can will be directed at the effort of getting this state and this country and this world on the side of sanity. That's zero carbon emissions by 2045. And that's going to cost a fair amount. What you just laid out, those three points are going to cost a fair amount. Can you get there without a carbon tax? Is that the way to get there? Well, we have a cap and trade, which is a price on carbon. I think that works better. Some states may want a carbon tax, but we all know that if you, if you want less of something, you need to tax it. If you want more of something, then you relieve all the burdens on it. We want less carbon, less pollutants, uh, less uh, methane, and that, uh, that pricing is a very important way to get there. But we also need regulations. And is it going to be expensive? Yes. Is it expensive of doing nothing? No. The expense of uh, the path we're on now is trillions of dollars more than it would, what it would be is if we get to zero carbon emissions. We have no choice. This is where the world's going. So, Governor, it's, I'm mindful that you're approaching the end of your term. You've had quite a storied political career. Have you accomplished everything you want? And I guess that really leads to, might you hold another public office? Well, I don't rule anything out. I've got a lot of ideas. I'm more experienced. I'm more skilled after having done this for the last uh, 45 years. Uh, but I'm also realizing this is the end of this time as governor. But I'll be around to work in whatever way or field uh, or, or other endeavor that I think my uh, services and experience can be of help. That was California Governor Jerry Brown at the Global Climate Action Summit. Coming up, Tesla could be on track to meet its Model 3 production goals. We'll have the latest next. 
and Bloomberg Technology is live streaming on Twitter. Check us out at technology and be sure to follow our global breaking news network at TikTok on Twitter. This is Bloomberg. It looks like Tesla may be on track to meet its Model 3 production goals. Tesla produced close to 6,700 vehicles over the last seven days. That's according to a new report by Electrek. The report claims that Tesla should meet its lower end Model 3 goal of 50,000 vehicles by the end of the month, and that it may even surpass that figure if production keeps trending up. It's only been two days since Apple unveiled its new iPhone XS, but Chinese pre-orders are already weaker than previous launches. That's according to Rosenblatt Securities. Analyst Ju Zhang points to consumers waiting for the release of the cheaper iPhone XR and a decline in smartphone subsidies from Chinese operator channels. And Kleiner Perkins has lost a top investor. Mary Meeker is leaving the VC firm to start her own fund, and she's taking her whole team with her. The new venture, set to launch in 2019, will make bets on late-stage companies. Meeker's departure drops the number of top decision makers at Kleiner Perkins from nine to five, and none of them are women. Kleiner Perkins now has just one female investor, Lynn Chow O'Keefe, who's also a partner. And up next, the push to get green technology into China. We'll hear from a fund trying to transform the environment of the world's second largest economy. Plus, Khan Academy doesn't just aim to prove test scores. It wants students to master their subjects. Sal Khan tells us how it plans to do so. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Technology. I'm Selena Wang in San Francisco and for Emily Chang. News and video aggregation app Chito Tiao has become the latest Chinese tech company to list in the United States. The Shanghai-based company priced at the low end of its marketed range, selling 12 million American depository shares at $7 apiece to raise $84 million in its IPO. It's the 24th Asia-based company to list in New York just this year. Bloomberg Technologies Alex Brinka asked Chito Tiao CFO Jingbo Wang why they chose a U.S. listing. We did compare all the options there, right? In China, in Hong Kong, in the U.S. But still, as a very young internet company, still very rapidly growing, I think the investor base here still understand our business best. Well, think about it in Hong Kong, other than Tencent, I can't really think of any sizable internet media company there. But in the U.S., there's just uh, more than 10 just out of China. So I think this is the right investor base. That's what, what we are, what we think is the most important. I will say, I did just see a Meituan list in Hong Kong. They raised about $4 billion. But back to your business, I am interested. Uh, Chu Tatiao means fun headlines. Give That's me right. a little bit more color on what exactly you do. How does Chu Tatiao make money? Sure. So we are actually um, quite in a, a uh, innovative type of uh, technology-driven media companies. Unlike uh, the older model where the media produce their own content, we don't produce any content. We aggregate content from various professional media and freelancers. Then we push customized feeds to the users. So here the secret recipe is not the content, it's really the algorithm. The algorithm finds out each user's interest, their behavior, and then push the most relevant content. So it's really a new technology-driven model. Uh, I haven't seen really something like this in the US, but in China, this has been proven to be a very uh, powerful model. And in terms of uh, our revenue, right, our monetization, that mainly comes from advertising. I'm curious, though, these platforms, um, folks where the content is found, in the U.S. you've seen a lot of concern around the likes of Twitter and Facebook. I know they have different business models, but I think the concern um, could potentially be the same. Is this real content? Is this relevant content for users? Is there fake news? Is that something that you're thinking about in the Chinese market? Do Chinese consumers have the same uh, kind of issues around veracity of content that we're seeing here right now in the U.S.? Yeah, I totally agree. It's uh, probably the same situation in China, even probably worse uh, with this uh, 
explosion in, in terms of the information available on the internet, right? There comes a lot of uh, fake news, lower quality content, uh, and uh, we actually, as a platform, right, we aggregate all the content. We spend a lot of time on basically ruining out all these lower quality content. That's a very important part of our job. And we want to make sure that the algorithm and also our editor teams pick, pick out all the best content and push the relevant content to user also based on the interest, not just the interest and also the quality. Both are very important. Interesting, so you do have actual humans there checking this and, and kind of curating content for the right people. Uh, yes, we have a, okay. We have two uh, two levels of uh, content inspection. First of all, the, that's the artificial intelligence powered a, a machine uh, a machine interface so that will screen out some of the lower quality content uh, or inappropriate content. And then we have a team of more than 500 people sitting there. They will review all the content and grade them. Uh, the content with lower grade will have minimal exposure to the users. I am curious, uh, Chu Tao is only a two-year-old company. It's been the trend here in the U.S. for big private tech companies to wait longer. The average wait time is about nine years between founding and IPO. Why go now? A lot of uh, your peers in China seem to be listing earlier. What's behind the decision to list now just two years into your life? Sure, sure. I think actually um, the listing is more about the branding and less about the money. It is actually even easier to raise money in the private market compared with the public market, but the status of being a public company does give us a lot of uh, additional uh, brand image, uh, uh, credibility, and that's very important for doing business in China and I guess probably anywhere in the world. The users trust us more, right? So they feel it's more, uh, more credible. So that's, uh, that's help, that helps the business a lot, actually. Chi Tiao CFO Jingbo Wang speaking to Bloomberg Technologies' Alex Barinka. Now, President Trump wants tariffs on about $200 billion more in Chinese products. Bloomberg has learned the president has instructed his aides to proceed with the tariffs, despite his Treasury Secretary's attempts to restart talks with Beijing to resolve the trade war. The new round would be in addition to the $15 billion, $50 billion of Chinese goods that already face a 25 percent duty. The Chinese have retaliated with tariffs on an equal amount of U.S. exports. This week, the Global Climate Action Summit gathered leaders from all over the world to discuss how to move forward in the fight against climate change. Notably, President Trump was sidelined as California and China pressed forward on climate initiatives. China's National Ministry of Ecology and Environment is even co-hosting a China pavilion to showcase Chinese efforts in the battle against climate change. But what does pressing forward on climate and clean energy initiatives look like despite pulling out of the Paris Climate Agreement? Here to discuss is Douglas Cameron, Senior Managing Director of the U.S.-China Green Fund. Now, Douglas, this fund was created under very different circumstances under the Obama administration. And since then, we've seen the U.S. pull out of the Paris Climate Agreement while China has been doubling down. So what does this mean for the investment landscape of the U.S. and China? So first of all, let me say a little bit about the, what the U.S.-China Green Fund is, is doing. It is a cross-border fund that was established in October of 2016 to address environmental problems in China. So our focus is how do we clean up and how do we improve the environment in China? And the focus has been on two parts. Initially, we've created a private equity firm in China that does investments in technologies in companies that don't necessarily look green on the surface, but it's the underlying strategy as we invest in companies that have deep access into environmental markets in China, building management companies, distribution companies, sales companies, so that we have the ability to understand what the markets are in China, to understand how to get access to the markets in China. And then the second phase is to invest in technology companies in the U.S. that can address those markets in China. Um, we aren't big fans of the tariffs, but at this point, there are lots of risks in venture capital and investing, and we just consider that one of the risks that we need to deal with. So why start a fund here in the U.S.? What sorts of technologies in particular are you looking for here? So first of all, just to clarify, the current fund is a China-based fund. It's an RMB-denominated fund. 
we are now beginning to roll out the U.S. side of the fund. And it's going to consist of two parts. First of all, we can already make investments in Western companies out of our RMB fund. We can help establish Chinese entities of U.S. companies so that they can tap into the China market. So we're actively doing that already. And we have made one investment and we're continuing to look at other investments out of our RMB fund. But we do believe we want to start a dollar fund as well so that we can do direct investments into U.S. companies in the clean tech space. I mean, clean tech focused funds really suffer during the dot com bubble and even in more recent years we've seen venture capital investments really decline pretty significantly. So how are you going to get LPs, limited partners, to invest in this USD fund? So first of all, we hope to show them that we have a very unique situation going in China and we're making incredibly good progress on the China side. I'm very familiar with um, clean tech 1.0 and some of the mistakes that were made. A lot of it was based on expectations of high oil prices, um, not understanding or not being aware of the low cost uh, natural gas. So those were some of the problems with clean tech 1.0. We're going at it, first of all, China is the biggest market for clean tech type products, clean tech energy and also clean tech in the home. So one, a big market. Second of all, we are very much market focused on the types of investments and through our understanding and our investments in the China side, we know what those markets are. Third, we're focused on deployment. We are focused on getting these products into the market fast within one or two years. And then finally, we are also um, just, just um, so the goal here is really to help these U.S. companies access the Chinese market, uh, which does also hit at one of the primary concerns of the current administration, though it's very appealing for yes. these businesses to access that market. So how are you going to protect these companies from intellectual property concerns? OK, one, that's one of the questions uh, most U.S. companies are concerned about when they go into China. One is that we will be a trusted advisor and help these companies navigate the China issues. We have a team of 40 people now in China with a wide range of experience, many of them trained in Western companies, in Western businesses. So we have lots of experience on the ground. We also have an understanding about what types of technologies are best protected in China, which ones are most difficult to protect in China. For example, um, if a company doesn't file intellectual property in China, it's really hard for them to argue that, um, that they don't have intellectual property protection. So advising startup companies here in California and elsewhere to make sure that a China IP strategy is a big part of what they do is important. Now, the past few decades of economic growth in China have come at the expense of the environment in some instances. And now China has been very aggressive in rolling out these environmental policies, including shutting down some of these most polluting industries. Right. But is it enough to reverse the damage? Um, you've got to start somewhere. Um, if you looked at L.A. back in the 60s or if you looked at uh, London in the, the last century, um, you've probably all seen p pictures of terrible pollution. So, yes, you have to start sometime. And I've already seen significant improvements in the air quality in Beijing. And we expect that um, not all of it will be corrected, but we think that it will be much, much better. All right. Well, Douglas Cameron, you're going to have to give us an update when you start making investments here in the U.S. Good. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Now coming up, Sal Khan wants anyone to learn anything anywhere. He tells us how online instructional videos could help bridge education's opportunity gap. Up next. And one of YouTube's largest channels just got bought out. How YouTubers are looking outside of the platform to turn a profit. Next. This is Bloomberg.
For today's teachers, meeting the individual needs of 30 students per classroom is near impossible. But for Sal Khan, 15 million students a month is no problem. Khan is the CEO and founder of Khan Academy, a nonprofit organization with the mission of providing free, world class education globally. With instructional videos and quizzes and subjects from basic math to advanced organic chemistry, the online platforms has helped students in over 190 countries, benefiting 140,000 teachers worldwide last year alone. And now in addition to opening a brick and mortar school in Mountain View, California, Khan is announcing new mastery learning features. Sal, you've talked a lot about mastery learning, which is basically allowing students to learn at the right pace. What exactly do you define it as and how are you applying it to Khan Academy? Yeah, mastery learning in some ways is the most common sense way to learn and it's not my idea. It goes way back. It's arguably the first way of learning, which is if you're learning a musical instrument and you're working on a more basic piece and you've got it 80% well, instead of moving on to the more advanced one, take the time necessary to learn the more basic one, then the advanced one will make more sense. Same thing in a math class. Over the last 200 years or so, we've had a, an education system that, for frankly logistic reasons, have had to not allow students to master things and move at their own pace, but instead move them all lockstep. And then what happens is we're in a seventh grade class, we're learning exponents, and I get an 80% on the exam, even though I have that 20% gap, we then have to move on to a more advanced topic. And what typically happens is that kids eventually hit a wall when they get to an algebra class or a calculus class or a physics class. And in mastery learning, you, you just, instead of holding fixed how long and when you do something with a variable outcome, you make variable when you can work on something and you say, hey, everyone should really master that concept and not have these gaps. And a few years ago, you went brick and mortar with the Khan Lab School. Two of your kids actually go there. I mean, what have you learned through that experience? Have you changed the model at all? Well, it's called a lab school on purpose so that because we're constantly changing the model. But the core underlying idea is around mastery learning, that if we let students use tools like Khan Academy to learn at their own time and pace, that at the end of the day, they're going to learn faster and they're going to learn more. And it takes a little bit of a leap of faith. Uh, every teacher we talk to, say a seventh grade teacher, they know that there's some students in that class who are operating at a fourth grade level and there's some students in the class operating in ninth grade level and they wish they could cater to their individual needs but they're like well if I let that one at the fourth grade level work on fourth grade work will they ever get to seventh grade uh, but what we're seeing is if you take that leap of faith you let them work on what is appropriate for them then when they get to the seventh grade work it happens much faster and are there major challenges with having students of all different ages in the same classroom there are some challenges when you think about you know who's mature for what book or whatever else but there's a lot of benefits too where students can mentor each other they can take care of each other you know my my daughter uh, when she was six she's seven now you know when she scraped her knee a couple of months ago the the first responder was a 12 year old and I think there's just something very powerful about that and it's something very natural it's the way we you know human history was like that. And you have 15 million learners a month in 190 countries. That's pretty impressive. You could probably easily monetize that. So why stay a nonprofit and keep it free? Yeah, you know, when, when Khan Academy started, it was it was a little bit delusional. I was operating out of a walk-in closet. It's much bigger. We, you know, we have 200 full-time employees now. But I, I, it, was, it was this idea of, like, well, maybe the Khan Academy could be a, an institution for the next generation of learners or many generations of learners. And I thought, well, a, a home run and a for-profit, that would be nice. But a home run as a not-for-profit, maybe it could be the next Smithsonian, the next a library system. And now it's not so delusional. We really do envision it, you know, well beyond my life and uh, generations generations to come that billions of people will hopefully be able to learn on Khan Academy uh, from pre-K all the way through the core of college, get jobs, uh, get credentials that will be recognized anywhere in the world. And so uh, it feels like the only way to stay focused on a vision like that is to stay nonprofit. And you've got dozens of impressive luminaries to buy into Khan Academy. You have Bill Gates, Eric Schmidt as advisors. How exactly have they impacted the organization? You know, I, I think their, their biggest impact has been one as advisors to, to help us think big. How do we really scale this to a global scale and reach the billions that we want to? Um, and really, they, they've also been really valuable amplifiers. You know, Bill Gates famously 10 years ago when, when he really got involved at Khan Academy was, was telling everyone, well, I use it, I use it, my children use it. And that was a big signal to a lot of folks because a lot of folks, when they see something nonprofit or free, they're like, okay, well, that might be good for the folks who can't afford something. I'll go off and pay these tutors or whatever else. But, but when Bill Gates said, no, no, I use it, that was a big signal to folks that, no, free doesn't mean not world class. And that's why our mission statement is a free world class education. Because we want it, and it is uh, arguably the most effective way to learn. And what do you make of these tech billionaires investing in education? I mean, we recently had Jeff, Jeff Bezos coming out and saying he's investing in uh, early education. I mean, what do you make of that? 
I think it's very positive. I think, you know, from, from the outside, it can sometimes feel like, oh, or, you know, is, 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 there, is there something deeper going on? But uh, everyone that I've interfaced with, many of whom have been donors to us, it's, it's, it's a very positive intent. Uh, they see what's happening kind of at a macro level, that, you know, the pyramid of, of our society where, you know, you need a lot of labor and then you have a, a kind of a middle class, it's kind of an information processing class, and then you have the top, which is the creative class, that that's changing, robotics, AI, are, they're collapsing those bottom two layers. So we need to invest in education so more people can participate at the top. All right, Sal Khan, fascinating work. Thank you so much for joining as always. Thank you. Now this weekend on Bloomberg Television, we bring you our best interviews from the week, including our exclusive conversation with Starbucks CEO Kevin Johnson on the coffee chain's push for a greener future. Tune in this Saturday for the best of Bloomberg technology. This is Bloomberg. In February, a German study found that 96.5% of all attempted YouTubers won't make enough money to crack the U.S. poverty line. But individual creators may have found a way to expand. YouTube's ninth most watched channel, a series of nursery rhymes praised by busy parents, has been bought by an agency called Moonbug. With ties to Disney and Teletubbies, Moonbug may use the channel to pursue other YouTube networks in hopes of building scale and pooling resources. Here to discuss further is Bloomberg's Lucas Shaw. Lucas, what's the significance of this deal? Do you think this means that we're going to see more YouTube channels merge with platforms, other traditional TV networks even? You know, it could mean some light at the end of the tunnel for some of these channels. We went through a wave of consolidation and deals a few years ago where a lot of traditional media companies who were nervous that they were losing kind of relevance among young viewers scooped up what, was, what were called multi-channel networks or MCNs, which were these networks or companies that had consolidated thousands of different YouTube channels. And they paid, in some cases, hundreds of millions of dollars. And most of these deals didn't work out too well for traditional media companies. But the fact that you know, this popular channel for kids can still sell may bode well for a bunch of other channels that are still out there and wondering what their exit's going to be. You know, life on YouTube, to the, the point about that data, is not easy for a lot of these creators. Right. What's interesting is that YouTube sales have skyrocketed, but it's getting rougher and rougher for these creators. I mean, was there a change in their advertising policy or algorithms that really caused this change? I just think it's kind of the, what happens inevitably with these big online tech platforms. If you think about it with Google, with YouTube, with Facebook, you know, they are designed to make, comp make money for those companies. You know, Facebook makes a ton of money from the fact that it has all of these news publishers on the site. But most publishers, they don't get money from Facebook. It's mostly a way of marketing or to make people aware that you exist. And it's kind of the same on YouTube. And so what you've seen with a lot of companies that built their business on YouTube is they've had to shift their strategy. You know, they're still YouTube is still very important and in some cases the most important platform for a lot of companies. But more than anything, it's a way of kind of engaging with your audience rather than making money from your audience. And you monetize your audience elsewhere. You sell merchandise, you sell books, maybe you sell subscriptions, which is something that YouTube has enabled recently. And what does this say about the huge market for kids on YouTube? I mean, I was just looking at one of their popular nursery rhyme compilations and it had a 2.1 billion views. What's driving this crazy growth? Uh, well, it, you know, kids are raised now with a smartphone in their hand, or a lot of kids are. You've seen in traditional TV the viewership for Nickelodeon, for Disney Channel, for Cartoon Network, for all these kids-focused networks has fallen off a cliff because more kids are not growing up watching cable TV. They're growing up watching video on the Internet. And I think YouTube is the biggest player there. You know, For all the attention that Netflix gets, for young kids in particular, YouTube is irresistible. The videos are small. You can watch them, or excuse me, they're short. You can watch them over and over again. It's free. It's just very easy to watch, which is why YouTube has a whole dedicated app for kids and why there are occasionally have been scandals when you've had kind of ads that you certainly want, wouldn't want a kid to see show in YouTube Kids. Do we know how big this deal was? Pretty small. I mean, it's an individual channel, you know, so we're not talking a hundred, couple hundred million dollars. I think we're talking single digits. Uh, but for one channel that's maintained by just a few people, that's still pretty good. All right, Bloomberg's Lucas Shaw, thanks for joining and bringing us that report. And that does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. I'm Selena Wang, and this is Bloomberg.